So now, yes, we are live and we are ready to uh, start the next part of the show here. Um, to start off, Summer, Ash, welcome back. Summer is going to be the moderator and she will do the introduction. Summer, do you want to go ahead and take it away? Uh, yeah, sure. All right. Um, I remember last time that I uh, didn't really properly introduce myself. Um, so just really short. Hi, everybody. I'm Summer Ash and I have been a rocket scientist and an astrophysicist, and now I'm an educator, science uh, super fan. Um, and I'm really excited to be here today with Garrett and Mike. I don't know which way I'm pointing. This is what I see. You're just, yeah, just pointing. It's sort of Brady Bunch, like look up in the corner. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, so today I am joined um, once again by Mike Massimino, former NASA astronaut and veteran of two space shuttle missions to the Hubble Space Telescope. Right. Um, and anybody out there who watches The Big Bang Theory probably recognizes him from several cameos on that. And he is currently a professor of engineering at Columbia University and a senior advisor to the Intrepid. Um, and then also joining me this time is Garrett Reisman, um, also veteran NASA astronaut, flew on all three space shuttles, um, Endeavor, Discovery, Atlantis, um, and you are a crew member on uh, NEMO, the NASA's underwater research station, um, and actually worked at SpaceX for close to seven years and is now also a professor of astronautical engineering at the University of Southern California. Welcome. Sorry, Summer. Mike, Mike is making me laugh. <laughs> he's, looking, he's looking at me funny. <laughs> that, that's how it's going to go, right? <laughs> making me yeah, laugh Summer. while I'm laughing, and that's making you laugh. It's your fault. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Summer, by the way, I was just um, I was just thinking about that time that I gave you that tour of JSC. I remember it really well. We talked oh, about yeah. it all the time. Yeah, yeah. We yeah. talked about it all the time. <laughs> that's right. Um, but Garrett, actually, um, I wanted to let you know that we met again um, in like 2008 for the Atlantis launch. I don't know, Doss, if you have that picture. Uh, I do. I'm, I'm fixing another issue here. It's Zoom is being Zoomy again, as always. <laughs> it's a little bit of a joke, but here's some evidence at least. Oh, uh, yeah. Look wow. at that. That's a good looking shirt. It is a good looking shirt, and it's a perfect uh, shirt for sleeping because it's super comfortable. Um, <laughs> so anyway, we'll just surprise you with that photo later. Um, right. So before we get into um, the main reason we're here, uh, Garrett, I wanted to ask you, since you've been on all three space shuttles, um, obviously, which one is the best and why? <laughs> <laughs> Can you ask that? <laughs> I did. Uh, I, I, would, I would go with Endeavor, and I'll tell you why, because, um, and, I, and that's probably a flop hog, because I know you got the Enterprise set right there on the deck, but I would go with Endeavor just because it was my first ride to space. So it was kind of a special, you know, thing. You always remember that. And, and so I would, I would say Endeavor. Although, you know, I, they're all great. You know, right? <laughs> that said like a very diplomatic parent. Yeah. Um, but also speaking of the fact that you guys might just be cracking each other up for the rest of the hour, um, I noticed in your crew shot for um, your mission, STS-132, Garrett, that you look like you're having the best time ever. I don't know if Doss has that picture or not. Oh, Doss, you can see what I'm fixing here. It. I'm not Mike. <laughs> Garrett, Garrett can recreate it. Recreate it. Are, you, are, are you talking about, are, are you talking about um, uh, the, the, the crew thing we did at the, with the Astros at Minute Maid Park, the baseball thing? Or are you talking about my, just my, my, my like headshot? Well, it's the actual NASA one where you guys are all in the orange light suits. Um, Oh, okay. It looks just like the, the crew, photographer the, just the made official it. crew photo. Yeah. Yeah. I think it was because Tony was making a joke, and I think he made me laugh. I think that maybe that's why it came out pretty good. He probably <laughs> said something funny. He t had a tendency to do that. So, oh, okay. <laughs> yeah. um, so we're here because next week, um, for the first time in uh, almost nine, ten years, uh, humans will launch from U.S. soil um, into space. And the last time that happened at Kennedy was July of 2011. I was curious if either one of you were at that launch. Uh, I, I was at that launch in 2011, yep. Yeah, and I was how, there too. Yeah, what, did, what, did, what were you kind of feeling at the time? It was, it was uh, kind of, uh, I guess, mixed feelings, you know. Uh, 
whenever you had a launch, you, you, you want your friends to get there safely. You kind of wish you were going with them, but you're not, you know, when you're watching, but, uh, but I, it was the end of, uh, of an era. And, um, and we had the sense that that was, it was almost surreal. I, I, uh, I really uh, enjoyed being a part of the shuttle program. I, um, when I, I first started learning about the space shuttle when I was in, in college, the first flight happened when I was in college and kind of inspired me to, to get involved with the space program. I was interested from the moon landing when I was a little boy, I, I'm old enough to remember Neil Armstrong on the moon. I was six years old. And then with, uh, with, with the shuttle program, it kind of got, got resurrected my interest. And uh, I worked on the shuttle program a little bit before becoming an astronaut. And then they, an opportunity to get to fly on it was a, truly a dream come true. I thought it was a great spaceship and I was disappointed to see it go. Um, but I also knew it was, it was going away for a reason. And I think now actually I'm feeling so, so good about what's going on with this flight coming up next week, because ever since that, that day that you mentioned in July of 2011, the last time we launched, you know, we've been, we've been waiting to launch again from the U S we've been launching successfully from, uh, from Russia, which is which has been a great partnership in that regard, getting getting our people to space. Chris Cassidy is up there now, so he got there. But there's really something about launching from the Kennedy Space Center. You invite lots of guests. Your family can be a part of it. Uh, it gets the whole place, the whole community going. And uh, uh, it was really in that way. It was sad to see that last launch happen, but I think now it's it's great that it's going to be happening again. All right. Yeah, I think the the word that got overused back at that time was bittersweet, but I think it was probably the most appropriate word because it was bitter in the sense that all the shuttles still had a lot more life left in them. They had, uh, the airframes were rated for up to a hundred missions and uh, none of them flew nearly that much. So they, they could have kept flying, but the problem was um, they had, uh, you know, it, it, the shuttle was amazing. I'm very, very honored and, and happy that I had the chance to fly on the shuttles. Um, you know, it, it, it's an incredible flying machine. You can launch like a rocket, land like an airplane, you could do spacewalks from its right from its airlock. It has a robot arm. It could take up pieces of the space station or the Hubble, and and it had all that capability, which is remarkable when you consider it's designed in the 70s. And I don't think we'll see another vehicle that versatile or capable for quite a while. However, all that complexity led to two kind of negative consequences. One was it wasn't the safest uh, vehicle that it could have been. You know, we, we lost two shuttles and some really, really, really good people, um, the, the, especially the crew on, on uh, Columbia is a crew that I knew personally, uh, and, uh, as opposed to the crew on Challenger, but they were all extremely good people and that hurt a lot. And then the other thing was it's extremely expensive. We're spending something on the order of uh, three or $4 billion a year keeping the program going. So we knew we could do better we knew we can make something more sustainable and safer, uh, but in order to do that, we were going to have to stop flying the shuttles because we weren't going to get an additional three or four billion dollars a year from Congress to make something new. Uh, so it was a difficult decision, but like Mike said, I think in retrospect, it was certainly the, the correct one. And I was so excited about the possibilities of what we can do with new vehicles that actually that led me to leave NASA back in 2010, uh, right about that time, and, uh, and join up with SpaceX. And Summer, yeah. Das here, we're go for graphics now. <laughs> hey, you want to show Garrett that uh, selfie we took? Yeah. <laughs> Keep talking while I bring it up. <laughs> <laughs> it's actually not. It's a selfie on my part, but you were um, boarding the space shuttle, I think, at the time. Because <laughs> I was okay. editing. Oh. There we so go. Worry. There we go. Oh, okay. <laughs> And can you show uh, the NASA official um, crew photo? There you, you go. Can... Oh, no, no, no. It's the one with all of them. In the oh, all of them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That one. He's definitely mid-laugh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I think uh, I think uh, Steve Bowen might have just poked me in the ribs. I'm not, I'm not sure exactly <laughs> what happened there. But... <laughs> uh, yeah. So, uh, Next week, so SpaceX is launching their Crew Dragon capsule atop a Falcon rocket, um, and NASA astronauts are on board and they're going to the space station. Um, this is huge to me. Um, I didn't know that, that I would ever see this kind of um, public private partnership that's going on. Uh, do you think this is pretty much the beginning of a new 
sort of shift of how we're going to be doing space flight going forward? It is, I, you know, I, I do believe it is. And, and um, you know, the big thing that this represents, this launch next week, is the return of NASA and the United States to being able to launch men and women into space, which is something we have not had the capability of doing for the past painful nine years. We've had this gap where we, where we as a country can't do that anymore. And that's going to end next week. And that's, that's probably the most significant thing uh, about what's happening. But you're right in that it's not just that. It's not only the return of NASA and the United States back into human space launch capability. It's also the whole new opportunities that develop because of the way it's being done with this public private partnership. So yeah, I do believe it's the start of a, a new golden age in, in space flight. And Garrett, were you involved um, in your time at SpaceX? Were you involved in the development of the like Crew Dragon program? Yeah, only like every day. <laughs> that, was, that was my job though. It, it was really funny because I, I, they brought me in with some crazy generic title. I think I was like safety and mission assurance engineer. Um, and, I'm, and, and if they would, if they didn't even write a job description, which was a good thing because if they mm -hmm. did, they would have had to thrown it out literally <laughs> on day one when I got called into Elon's office and he sat me down and he said, you know, we just uh, applied for this NASA contract for commercial crew. Uh, if we win this thing, I need somebody that can kind of be the program manager, run this thing. Can you do that? And I said, sure. You know, how hard can that be? And <laughs> turns out it's really hard. I had no idea. Kind of, it was really hard. And, uh, but I said, sure. And so that became my job changed literally on day one. And I ended up working in some form or another on everything that led up to, uh, this, to this launch. Uh, ever since working on winning the, the the subsequent NASA contracts as our capture manager, leading our proposal teams, and then I was director of our space operations group when we got serious about flying uh, Dragon, both cargo and crew Dragons to space. Yeah, and so the path to getting here was kind of. Can you walk us through that? I think it's roughly, you know, the development of the the rocket, and then these landing capabilities, and then also the development of this crew capsule. And then just yeah. so, testing. You know, it started out, uh, SpaceX started out with the, the original version of the Falcon 9 rocket and and the, and the original Cargo Dragon, the Dragon 1 or Cargo Dragon vehicle. And uh, they've come a long way. The, the, the Falcon 9 and, the, and the, the Dragon, the Crew Dragon that we're going to launch next week are very, very different in many, many ways from the original versions that I saw when I first got there. But they build upon that experience, and um, and, and we were able to, to get some flight heritage on on hardware and software and also operations, and we learned a lot. But really, even though from the outside they kind of look the same, they're really very very different vehicles. Um, and the two astronauts that are flying um, next week are uh, NASA astronauts Doug Hurley and Bob Benkin. Did That's you guys? Great. I think both overlapped in the astronaut corps with them. Um, so you guys know them fairly well? Yeah, Mike, what do you think of those guys? Uh, I like those guys. I, I was, just to give you the overlap, I was uh, selected in 96, in the class of 96. Garrett came along in the class of 98, and then Bob and Doug were in the class of 2000. So I overlapped with, with those guys for uh, 14 years until I left NASA in, uh, in uh, whatever it was, 2014. So uh, yeah, I, I kind of like those guys, Garrett. You, but I remember, I remember this. I remember Garrett was a kind of a new astronaut. We were picking that class of 2000. Tell me if I'm wrong on this, Garrett. But I remember sitting in a robotics branch meeting with Nancy Curry, and she was on the selection board, and she said, "Do you know anybody good that's interviewing?" And Garrett said, "Bob Benkin." Because you went to, uh, did you go to grad school with him? Or didn't you guys go to grad school together? I, I said Bob Bacon, but I said, Bob Bacon, whatever you do, don't pick him. <laughs> well, from, from, from Garrett, it must have been a good luck for Bob. No, like no, him. no. Bob's, Bob's a great guy. <clears throat> I know Bob for a very long time. Uh, in fact, Bob, you're right, Mike. Uh, both Bob and I were grad students together at Caltech before either one of us had applied to be astronauts. We were students together. We had offices right across the hall. In fact, I don't think I could have passed my part of my qualifying exam for my PhD without Bob's help. I, I kind of owe the guy. So now I'm making fun of him, which is I shouldn't do that because I really owe the guy. And it's, um, okay. it's okay. He's in quarantine. He can't hear you. Oh, that's right. He won't hear you. He's not going to hear any of this, right? Don't worry about it. So, 
so I could yeah I could tell you the truth but um and, <laughs> but no uh, so yeah I know him I've known him for a long time um yeah but um is it correct that there's um four SpaceX astronauts like a backup crew there's a backup crew yeah uh, yeah so they're 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 um not really a backup crew per se for, for this demo flight, uh, but they've been uh, training, they haven't been training as long as Bob and Doug have, but they joined the cadre at some subsequent date and they're getting ready uh, for the next SpaceX Crew Dragon launch. So the Crew One mission, which yeah. is gonna follow uh, fairly soon on the heels of, of this mission. Uh, in fact, what, we're, what, they're, what NASA is doing is they're, cut, they're, they're stuck in a bit of a quandary here because they want to keep the Demo 2 mission, Bob and Doug, up on the space station as long as possible because they need the, they need the manpower. They need, the space station program needs American astronauts to get work done up there. But at the same time, until Bob and Doug come home and we get the vehicle back and we do all the post-flight analysis, we can't really say that the certification process is done because keep in mind, Demo 2 is still a test flight. It's part of the verification and validation exercises that go along for certification. So the big NASA stamp of approval doesn't get put on the paperwork until they come home. So they have to, they want it. So here's a, here's the trade. They want to keep them up there as long as they can to get work out of them. But at the same time, they need to bring the thing back so that they can say it's certified so they can fly the next mission. Right. So that's the juggling act that NASA's uh, doing here. But the next mission should come later this summer and that will be the crew one mission. And those two fellows, uh, uh, Victor Glover, uh, Hopper and uh, Mike Hopkins. Uh, let's see, Shannon Walker is on that flight, and Soichi Naguchi, uh, a JAXA astronaut, is on that flight as well. Karen, I got a question for you, Nana. How many of those uh, spacecraft do they have? Is it just one crew dragon, and they've got to get this one back, and, and or is there a bunch of them, or they got what's how many do they have? That's a good question. Um, you sound like you kind of know what you're talking about. <laughs> I have no idea, that's why I'm asking the question. <laughs> we got. No, that's a good question. So, uh, so um, the, the thing of, uh, about this is actually the contract we wrote for, um, for commercial crew, for, for this, the, this phase of commercial crew, is that the vehicle, both the rocket and the spacecraft, will be brand new each time. Now, SpaceX has in the past reflown both rockets and, 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 and dragons, and they definitely intend to do so in the future. But for, for crew, the Crew-1 vehicle is a brand new capsule and, and, and a brand new spacecraft, and it will be a brand new Falcon 9 as well. Now, the, the, the Demo-2 uh, spacecraft and the Demo-2 rocket will be reused, both of them, uh, assuming uh, that we get the booster back successful and everything. But there are plans to reuse both the, the, the booster and the spacecraft again, but not for a NASA mission. It will be for not one for of the first NASA. private missions. And how many NASA, how many NASA missions uh, are there? Do, do we know yet? I mean, how many of those spacecraft are they going to build for NASA? Well, on, on, on this contract, I believe, if I remember correctly, after Demo 2, there's a total of up to four operational missions, Crew 1 being the first one of those. Okay. Uh, and then, of course, there's the hope that, and the intention that there'd be a follow-on contract and we'll keep making more. So, so you so just make more space. keeps running. At any given time, there are, there are many Dragons in uh, production at any given at any given time, so there, 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 are, there are more coming. You said the shuttle had, had 100 launches on each airframe. Is there a is there a max launch that that these things are built for? The number of launches that these things are built for? You know, I think that they're not going to put a a, a a limit or, or a number on that until they get them back and, and see yeah. what is uh, see see how what kind of condition they're in after they return, yeah. and then see like what's required to refurbish them in between flights. Yeah. So until they until they check all that out, I don't think they, I don't think they know for sure. There's not. Um, uh, I, I think the hope is that, um, you know, that we can get a substantial number of flights out of each of these, like a, an order. A, a, a hope at least like ten or so. But, but uh, I think it depends on, on the data, uh, and we'll have to look at that when it comes back. Sure, Mike. Those are really good questions. What What do you want to ask Garrett next? <laughs> <laughs> I missed Whoa. all that. I bet it was good. <laughs> we, we just got to zoom fast forward there, Mike. Uh, we may have lost Mike a little bit. Mike, you copy? That's okay. You're still here, Garrett. Okay. Yeah. Do you want me, uh, you want me to text him? I could text him. <laughs> He's frozen. He looks quite dapper, but uh, let's just... Uh... At least frozen in a, in a um, flattering face. Could be worse. <laughs> Oh, 
He just moved a little. Oh, he moved. My back? He's back. Back. We've reacquired the signal there. Okay. okay. Uh, there, I missed uh, the I, question. I was just asking, Garrett, do they, they have names? Like, you know, Endeavor, Atlantis, Columbia, blah, blah, for our space shuttles. Are they naming these things? Or, or... You know, I don't, that's a good, that's a good question. I don't think so. I think it's just I think that quickly, I, I think quickly you need to get on a phone with your friend Elon and name the first one recently. God, no, I don't think that's going to happen. Right. <laughs> Maybe mess with me, no. But the, uh, 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 the, I think, you know, we just, when we're working on it, we just call it the Demo 2 vehicle, uh, the Demo 2, the Crew 1 spacecraft. I don't think that they, and maybe they'll surprise me and I don't know, uh, reveal some some uh, more catchy name, you know, like maybe Fred <laughs> or something. There's an opportunity Fred. there. Yeah, there is. Yeah, we should maybe sell some naming rights. That's a good idea. Um, Commercial so program. Actually, Mike mentioned that, um, Doug and Bob are in quarantine, and I just wanted to clarify for other people that that's an extra quarantine than than what some of us are in right now, right? That's right. Yeah. I think one of the cool things about this is getting back to the Kennedy Space Center is that the crew quarters that we used to stay in, that all astronauts stayed in, I don't know when they first started that, but certainly the Apollo missions, uh, maybe before then too, but certainly with the Apollo missions, they stayed at crew quarters. The same suit room that we used for the shuttle program was used by the Apollo astronauts and are going to be used by uh, by Bob and and, uh, and Doug on Wednesday. Um, and that quarantine that is set up, it's a, it's a, I think it's about eight days. I think it's the same for these guys. I don't know if they have them in there longer or not, but, but it was about an eight day quarantine. You started at the Kennedy, at the Johnson Space Center and moved over to the Kennedy Space Center. Uh, so, somewhat similar to what we're going through now with the virus is you, you try to stay healthy and not encounter any germs. And so to do that, you need to be in a clean environment and not around a lot of people. And anyone that came near us had to be checked out by the medical staff. And there were, I forget the, the limit, like for kids, the ages of the kids, uh, my first flight, my kids were too young. They were like seven and nine. And then when they were 13 and 16, they were old enough that they could come, you know, come see me. Uh, but, uh, you know, there was a limit on the age of the kids as well, but you could have only a limited number of visitors. And, uh, when you were in quarantine, you're trying to keep health and some of what kind of similar to what we're doing now. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, we practiced uh, during that period of time. We practiced social distancing. Uh, you know, we definitely limited our contact, and and we had a rule that only people who were approved in, to be inside the quarantine could come within, I think, like 30 feet of us. So um, uh, it, it, there is a story about a, a commander uh, who was driving a little too fast. He'll go nameless, but he was driving a little too fast down there at the Cape. Uh, you know, at the, at, while we're in quarantine, leading up to the launch. And when the police pulled him over, he said to the officers, he started stepping out of the vehicle and said, stay right there. If you come any closer, you're going to be in breach of quarantine. <laughs> and the officer turned around and got back in his car and drove off. If you're, if you're speeding around the Cape, you could try it. I don't know if it'll work for you. But yeah, I, yeah, it, it, try, uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Try it now. Stay six feet away, officer. <laughs> That's right. Yeah, I don't think um, that'll work. I saw on um, Twitter, was it this morning that they did a flight readiness review and they were social distancing yeah. in the control? Yeah, it looked really uh, unusual. Yeah. Usually that, that uh, usually a flight readiness review is a room full of people shoulder to shoulder. And I saw that picture too, and they're all well spread out. So uh, they're, they're, they're doing everything they can to keep everybody safe on, on the ground as well as the, the flight crew. Yeah, I was just gonna say, um, I guess that anyone who's allowed actually onto the Kennedy grounds will also kind of be forced to social distance. So like the families, the friends that are coming. Um, well, actually, so I can tell you um, that they, they pretty much shut down all the, all the launch guests. They're okay. gonna have a very, very small, like their, their immediate families will be there, but that's gonna be about it. All the extended friends and family, like Mike, uh, you probably had a ton of people come down and, 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 uh, and watch you launch. And, and we had, you know, spaces where we can seat them at the Saturn V facility or on the causeway. And all that's not happening uh, for this launch. The only people uh, coming on to the KSC uh, grounds are going to be people as, uh, associated with the launch. The, the, even that, even the, I could tell you, even the, the media, even the, the press passes were greatly restricted this time around. They, they, they were very selective in, in the media passes that they gave out. So they're really controlling that access a lot. Yeah. So by the way, in the public service message, that means that you're not going to be able to like get out on that causeway and separate from other people 
If you're thinking about going and watching this in person, I recommend you do not do that. Because um, first of all, there's gonna be great coverage online. You'll be able to see uh, uh, NASA has its own webcast and SpaceX will be doing the webcast too. Uh, I think a lot of other media channels are gonna cover it. So you can just stay home and watch it from home. And besides, after the first couple seconds, right, Mike, once the rocket goes up a little bit, you can't see any, much anything anyway. No. So you guys will just watch on TV with a really good camera. <laughs> And then, really uh, and then the second, so if you do go, you're going to be stuck out there in, in Cocoa Beach, you know, with, with probably throngs of people. And it's really going to be impossible to watch this thing and stay safe. So I, I do recommend that, that, you, that you stay home. Are you going, Garrett? Yes, I'm going. <laughs> <laughs> but here's the thing. I'm, I'm, I have my own airplane. I'm flying by myself in complete quarantine all the way from L.A. to Florida. And then when I get there, I'm, I'm, I'm badged to get on to KSC and stay away from everybody. So I'm going to do this incredibly paranoid and carefully, but yeah. Okay. <laughs> now I'll be actually, I'll be, uh, I'll be in New York, but I'll be on one of those broadcasts. I mean, I'm going to be participating with the discovery channel. It's going to be uh, streaming it. Uh, so I'll be, uh, be on with them. So. so Mike, did, you, did you talk about, um, the launch or the this program in your class this semester at Columbia. Uh, the uh, the commercial. You mean the program we're doing now? Yeah. Uh, so, the, the three the three of us were going to be talking. I didn't know if we knew about that during the semester, but I certainly should have. <laughs> um, I no, I, I uh, no, yeah. So we certainly talked about SpaceX. We had Garrett come and speak to my class about it. It wasn't last year. I mean, we this year was too crazy. You know, we ended up doing most of the online teaching, and it was kind of nutty. But uh, last year, Garrett gave a great talk to my uh, students about uh, about uh, SpaceX and the commercial crew program. Um, uh, yeah, we certainly talked about it. Something they're very excited about. A lot of our students, uh, the, the, my students at Columbia, who want to get involved in the space program, they go to SpaceX. And I've had a couple students go there, and uh, also some of the other commercial companies, uh, private companies uh, like Blue Origin and uh, Virgin Galactic and, and others. So it, it attracts a lot of smart students and this is what they're excited about i think the the young people today are you know and get when i was when i was going through grad school and you wanted to fly in space and work in a space program that pretty much meant nasa trying to become a nasa astronaut like Garrett and i did or working for nasa or a big contractor that worked with nasa and now there's so many more opportunities and uh you know after after wednesday it, it, it'll, it'll create i think even more interest and and more opportunities so uh, yeah, it's a very, uh, very uh, hot topic with uh, with students today. Yeah, I wanted to um, point out that SpaceX, in addition to just being responsible for the flight hardware, they also had to train the astronauts on their hardware and come up with their own spacesuits. Yeah, and everything, which are quite different from what you guys wore. Yeah, is yeah. So we we uh, SpaceX is highly vertically integrated and. We do almost everything uh, in house. You know, we do almost everything ourselves. Even the spacesuits were, you know, at one of my one of my early jobs, one of the hats I wore early on when we were a smaller company was I was our in charge of the spacesuits for a brief period of time, and I set out. Uh, I made up a, a request for proposals, which is a document you send out uh, with a bunch of requirements, and we and I sent it to all the usual space suit manufacturers like ILC Dover and. Um, uh, David Clark and, and a bunch of other ones. And, <laughs> sorry? I didn't even know there were usual suspects for manufacturing. There are. Suits. Yeah, there, there, there aren't many of them. There, are, right. there aren't that many spacesuit companies, but there are a couple. And there are even a couple startups that we contacted as well. But at the end of the day, when we looked at what they were offering and how much money it was going to cost, we decided that, hey, you know, um, how, we, we, should, we should try to do this ourselves. So we ended up making these suits pretty much from scratch. And um, we, we have our own team that uh, designed it. We, we came up with some of the very basic architecture when I was still uh, working on it, but then we rapidly handed it off to an engineering team that actually d designed and developed the, fi the final version that you see here. And um, uh, yeah, I, th I think they did a really great job. It's, uh, it it's a definitely uh, a much more modern looking suit. One of the things that actually was one of the requirements I wrote into the, into the uh, plan was that is one piece, because I don't know, Mike. Remember when we get up in the in the in the shuttle with the with the suit that we had, the Aces, the orange suit. They um, it, it, it had you know it, it just all came apart. There are tons of, of bits and pieces to that thing, and he had you know had up to seven crew members in there, so he had like 14 boots. 
you had 14 <laughs> gloves you got and and in zero gravity that stuff goes everywhere and trying to keep it and you had to stuff it into laundry bags and to, which one that is that is that my com cord or is that your com cord hey that's my hat what are you doing you know it's my like, it's like a big pain in the neck right yeah so, so this we're is, not going to do that no pain in the neck so this okay, is everything right. one piece boots. one piece uh, if, if you look at the suit, even the even the gloves and the boots and the helmet, they're all permanently attached. None of it comes Wow. Out. Yeah. That's yeah, true. I saw, uh, there was video of um, the guys getting into one of the capsules in the suits, but they had the gloves off, but they were like like those mittens on, on your winter coat or something. Mm. Like the, the sleeve yeah. was still one piece, but the hand was out. There's actually a zipper right here that you wow. can undo. You unzip it down, and then you can pull your hand out. If you need yeah. to, you know, if you need a barehanded operation, then you put your hand right back in, zip it up. Pretty good. You still wear? Do you still wearing a, a cooling garment underneath, though? A no, it's air cooled, so all you have underneath is just a, you know, uh, basically long underwear, nothing fancy. The, the uh, there's no liquid cooling for the suit. Uh, it also has just a single connection, a single like umbilical connection. It's right yeah. uh, in your thigh. You just plug it straight into the seat. You get, um, you can get oxygen through there. You can get. Um, nitrox, it's a, it's it's air basically, but with a slightly different, a higher, a little bit higher oxygen content, um, and you get your communications um, all through that single uh, connector, and and uh, uh, so so you know you just you make one connection, you're done. Wow. Yeah, a lot a lot of lessons learned from. I had to listen to my crewmates complain endlessly about the Asus, you know, and I remember lying on our back getting ready to launch, and my commander went shut up about how much a suit was bothering him. So I was like, I, I don't want anybody talking about my suit that way. So, <laughs> so we tried it with, as much as we could to get rid of those things. And those helmets, they're 3D printed. Is that right? Yeah, the helmet, the helmet is really the only hard element. The, the, the rest of the suit is all made out of soft goods. So it's, it's pretty comfortable um, and uh, much more flexible than uh, and, and easier to move around in when it's not pressurized. And, and the helmet is uh, the only exception to that, and it is printed, and um, uh, it, it also contains all of the expensive pieces, like the, the pressure regulators, the communications equipment, it's all built into the helmet, so that the, the rest of the suit, uh, the rest of the suit is also bespoke, so we, we, uh, we make a new one for each, for each crew member that's fitted perfectly for them, uh, because, because of the lack of the hard pieces, to get good pressurized performance, you need to have it fit really well. So each of those suits is is made for them. Now I have said I have worn Doug's suit. I will admit that. Um, How did it fit? And because uh, because we're kind of close in size, so uh, for certain training exercises we're doing development work, I've worn that thing. It didn't fit me perfectly. Uh, I'll just leave it at that. But the um, <laughs> but but I have worn that suit uh, with a diaper on. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, the diaper's, not, the diaper's not the unusual part of the wardrobe <laughs> when it comes to what you're wearing. No, but you should be grateful that I did wear a diaper, you know. <laughs> now, because the helmet is 3D printed, does that mean technically if something were to happen to it during launch that um, they could just reprint one on the space station? The diaper? <laughs> no, they don't print that. <laughs> This is what you meant in your tweet about. <laughs> what? Yeah. What? Yeah. No. No, the, uh, uh, no. I don't think they would. Um, you know, the the, the, the helmet. Uh, if anything, the, the helmet, the, the structure of the helmet, I think, is pretty robust. Uh, if they had to, they could send up another one on a cargo ship. Uh, but there's really no easy way, but that to reconnect the helmet to the suit. So, so actually, what they do is they make a backup suit for each crew member, and probably. If anything went, really went wrong, they would send up a new suit. Um, it, it's in the backup line on there. So they always have one in reserve. Yeah. I heard though that like the head, you can go like 180, like 90 degrees left and right, which when your guys' um, space walk helmets, you know, your head would turn, but the helmet would really wouldn't. Yeah, the, the, the helmet's connected to the shoulder there with, 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 soft, with soft goods, with, you know, so you can turn your head. And, and we, we had the ability to turn our head inside our helmets. Uh, either when we're out there EVA and the EMU or, or inside the ACES. But here, the, the helmet will turn with you. It's conformal, which is actually another lesson we learned, a safety lesson we learned from Columbia, that it's better that it's not good to have your, your head free to move around inside the helmet. 
it's better to be like a motorcycle helmet and keep it conformal, which this is. So in this in this case, you actually can turn your head, and and the helmet will turn with your head, and and you will if you can have relative rotation of the helmet to your shoulders, which is something that we couldn't do in the in previous suit. That's right. Yeah, that sounds quite nice. Um, uh, can we put a picture, Doss, of the crew capsule interior up there? Because that also looks like both this suit and the um, crew capsule look super futuristic um, and kind of like very streamlined and simple. Um, oh, the interior, Doss. The interior, ah. Can you tell me uh, more about that, um, Garrett? It looks also like super, obviously that's facing the crew, but the crew is also looking at more screens rather than buttons. Is that correct? Yeah, so aesthetics and, 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 and design were incorporated into what we did when we, when we built this capsule and, and the suits. And, um, and, 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 you know, in the beginning, I, I'll admit that I was a bit of a skeptic, you know, I, I'm an engineer, it's all about function. And um, when we said we wanted to, you know, we wanted the suit, not only the function, uh, but to look good. I was like, really? But, but then I, I kind of came around and saw the, the logic to that because part of what we're doing here is we're trying to open up spaceflight to a whole, a, a much bigger group of people than just a couple of lucky government employees that have been able to do this in the past, right? So, so one of the ways, one of the, the, the missions here is to get people excited about spaceflight. And in fact, one of the things that Elon is trying to do is get people hopeful about the future in general. Just have something that looks really good that, that, that you can, that you want to be a part of something that excites you, and 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 if it doesn't look good, it's not as effective, you know. So, so so it turns out that it, you know you can make a, an interior of a spacecraft, you can make a spacesuit that not only works well, you can also make it look good. You can do both, is what I learned, uh, without sacrificing either one. It's just that nobody really had tried before, <laughs> you know. So so I think that uh, what we found was that it's it's doable, and and I think it is going to pay dividends because I think. When we see Bob and Doug walking in those suits and climbing into this vehicle, uh, it, it's going to get a new generation of, of people hopefully excited about spaceflight. Yeah, it's like you said before that um, NASA couldn't really uh, try and do a bunch of this other new development on the side while still operating the space shuttle program and having funds for that. So this kind of pause in that is a great opportunity to finally be able to go back to scratch and like come up with something brand new for the new era, essentially, right? Yeah, yeah, I think so. So there are a lot of unique things in, in here. One thing you can't quite see, it's right, it's because it's kind of perpendicular to the view of this of the shot is the touch screen that uh, it sells. And so it, most it's of the operation of this, of this vehicle, yeah, it's on the top there. Most of the operation of this vehicle is done, there you go, no, oh, well done. <laughs> um, Bam. Is uh, yeah, SpaceX technology, I'm impressed. It is done by uh, by touchscreen. There's very, very few hardware switches, only for really critical functions. Uh, is the only thing that there's actually a physical switch for. And so that's also very different from what we've uh, flown in the past. Uh, you even, even when you fly this vehicle, if you fly the vehicle manually, you do it by touchscreen. There's no stick. So that's another right. unique attribute. So where are the windows, though? Are there windows? Uh, they're, they're just out of the field of view of this picture. So there's uh, there are... are um, a uh, total of four windows. There are two that, that are uh, right on either side of the hatch. Maybe if we go back to that external view again, you can see them. Ah, those, yeah. Yeah, there they are. Those two, those two, those two windows right there. And there were two more around the back side, but I think we cut those out. Turns out it gets pretty hot back there. And Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> now, Mike, is that enough of a window for you? Because I remember in your book, you said that um, at one point, I think when you launched, you didn't have the window view, but one of your returns, you did. You uh, yeah. Did. So yeah, on the shuttle, we had a flight deck and a mid deck, and uh, four crew members uh, flew on the flight deck, and three were on the mid deck. And for both of my launches, I was on the mid deck. For landing, though, on my second uh, flight, I was on the on the flight deck. But I, you know, you're not going to be in this vehicle that long. Um, I think it would be, you know, you're going to be in, are they going to, when are they docking, uh, Garrett? Is it uh, same day or? I think or it's it, uh, T plus 18 or 19 hours. All right, so you're so inside. 18 of, or 19 hours after, after launch. After launch. So you're in this thing for that long. And 
and uh, you know you have a window to, to see what you need to see, I guess. But but you would want you would want a bigger window if you were going to be in there longer. And they're going to be on the space station for a long time, and there's plenty of plenty of windows there. The cupola, of course. So yeah, uh, yeah I think that 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 looks. I mean, I, I mean, Garrett, I'm sure did a perfect job on everything, and that looks pretty good to me. You get you get some window view, uh, and uh, w windows are problematic though. You know, they're you got to worry about thermal properties and materials and so on, but you, you know, it's nice to have them. But, but I think for you know, 18 hours, that's that's uh, plus plenty. That's just one of my favorite scenes from the right stuff when they're looking at the Run a window. Yeah, 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 well, yeah. Actually, I showed that scene so in, in, my, in my class. I, I showed the same one, actually. You do? <laughs> no. Yeah, we want a window. Yeah. I, I use that uh, in my human factors class to talk about the importance of not only uh you know when you're allocating functions between humans and machines to consider what the humans want in addition to uh what the engineering calls for you know you need to consider both so yeah yeah i feel like if docs if you could put up a picture of that glove up close again that mike that would have come in really handy for all of those um 111 screws or whatever yeah um, that's a glove uh that glove is that gloves for you know in the in the uh, cabin only, though, right? Garrett, I mean, that, that's, there's not, this is not a space walking suit. No. That's correct. That, that's correct. Oh, that's, this, this, yeah. You're right, Mike. This suit is only for, it's an IBA suit or a get me down or a rescue suit. It's only uh, to be worn inside in case of an emergency. And hopefully, we'll never actually pressurize. I mean, only if you have a really bad day will this thing ever really inflate. Uh, uh, but having said that, and uh, all that is true, I've worn this glove. And even though this glove is completely made out of soft goods, there's no palm bar or uh, any other hard materials in there. Um, it, uh, it, it, when it's pressurized, that glove has more dexterity uh, than, than the phase six that we did, the glove that we used on the EM wow. unit for spacewalking. Uh, mm -hmm. It's really remarkable. It's, it's uh, a guy by the name of Peter Homer came up with a really unique way of, of getting pressurized mobility out of a, out of a, a glove using purely soft elements. It's, it's it's it, it's he actually originally he used that um technology to win the nasa challenge they had a glove challenge where they had people enter to try to make a, a, a an improved space suit glove he won that thing and then we hired him and he made this and it, it's great nice and you might have said this before but what are, what materials is the suit made out of the suit that, the, the you know i i got to be careful i'm not sure how much of this is considered spacex proprietary but, it, it, but like most suits, I could tell you it has a, 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 a pressure layer. So it has like a, a, a layer that is airtight to, to keep in the, the, the air. And then it has a restraint layer on the outside that takes the loads when it does inflate. So you don't use the bladder layer to take the, the forces. Uh, and so uh, they're, they're made of different materials. Uh, and the outside, as you would expect, it also has flame retardant properties. So it's made of material similar to like the Nomex that's in these these jackets that Mike and I are wearing right now, for example. Yeah, I know. Where's my jacket, guys? <laughs> uh, I don't know about Mike, but I got this one at the gift shop. You can just go down to the to the, when you're down there at KSC, you can buy one. You can I'll buy them. The supplier them. makes them. I forget remember the name, but you can. They'll sell you stuff. <laughs> right on. Um, so this is going to be a really exciting launch, but there is, you know, some level of risk too, right? It's the first time, like, would you, both of you guys, would you get on that rocket in a heartbeat? I, I would be happy to ride it. I mean, um, and, I, and, 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 and actually a harder question to, to answer is, am I happy about our friends Bob and Doug riding it? You know, it's always easier to say I'll do it uh, uh, in a way. But um, I, I'll tell you that, um, I'm feeling pretty good about this, and, and I don't want to jinx it or anything. Or, uh, but but uh, I'm I'm sleeping pretty well at night, even though we're only a week away from launching. And I think the reason for that is, although th there's a lot of things were very different in how we went about designing and developing and testing and this 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 rocket compared to what NASA has done in the past, the one part of this whole process that's exactly the same as it's always been is the certification process. So the, the lengthy and extremely rigorous process of verification, validation, and certification that we go through to prove to NASA that we met every single requirement and that we do all these analyses, there's safety analyses, there's hazard reports, there's 
um, just a, a ton of documentation and, and, and uh, work done to, to make sure that we've really done our homework and it's as safe as it possibly can be. And I'm very confident in that process as it played out. Um, so I think that it's as safe as it's, it's, it's ever could be. The first flight of a brand new vehicle always in, incurs a bit more risk than, than flights later on. Looking back to the shuttle, I, I mean, it's amazing. And, and what I learned in retrospect about how uh, much bravery it took for John Young and Bob Crippen to fly that very first mission, that STS-1, you know, I've, my respect for those two guys was always huge, but it's gone up another order of magnitude uh, when I realized, you know, just what that took. And I think that uh, that all the things we're able to do to buy down risk with this with this vehicle, um, that um, it really what we're asking of Bob and Doug is not on the, on the same order of what we uh, what we asked of, of uh, Young and Crippen. Yeah, Mike, same thing, answer. Uh, I wouldn't mind getting inside and going back to space. Yeah, that'd be all right. Um, but you know, there's a you get there's a lot of training and a lot of knowledge that has to be. Garrett probably knows the vehicle as well as uh, well as anybody. So, but I'd have an awful lot to learn before I'd be ready to get inside of it to fly it. But sure, I would, no, you'd would be, be fine. Great. Mike, that's the thing. You you'd be fine. Because, you know, maybe you know. Look, we'll we'll, we'll give you the uh, the owner's manual. You can check right. that out. But it, it's uh, you would do great. And, and one of the reasons is actually it's much easier to fly this vehicle than it's a it's a heck of a lot easier to fly this vehicle than the shuttle. Oh, okay. uh, the shuttle you can fly this vehicle as a single as a single pilot really. It's it's designed that you can do that if you needed to. Um, and and really the the level of automation in this vehicle compared to shuttle it's it's just night and day. I mean all the stuff that we train to do on the flight deck of, of the orbiter uh, are things that the, the software on Dragon more or less does all those things itself. Like the the, the, way I, the analogy I talk about or the example I give is, Mike, you remember, like if we had a failure of one of the pumps in the cooling system, the shuttle was smart enough to light up a light that says uh, something's wrong. <laughs> and we had to go look at exactly what was wrong. Yeah. And and uh, and then we had to take a switch and turn that bad pump off once we figured out, yeah, it's really bad, not just a sensor, it's bad. And then we had to say, oh, there's a backup pump. We should turn that one on. And you have to flip another switch. And then you have to look at another screen to see whether or not the pressure came up and the flow rate is right. You know, we did all that and we retrained to do all that while we're shaking and, and going up to space, right? Well, well, Dragon does all of that itself. You know, it just, and it just says, hey, uh, primary pump failed. I turned on the backup. It's looking mm -hmm. good. And, and it, yeah, okay, thank you. You know, it's, 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 it's way, it's way more advanced in, in that sense. And, and it should be. I mean, look, even even our cars that we drive today do stuff like that. Um, it's it's crazy when you think about all we had to do manually in the shuttle. But it's yeah. understandable when you consider that the shuttle was designed using the best computer technology that the 1970s had to offer. Yeah, compared to the shuttle, with the probability of accidentally hitting a button or flipping a switch, um, is there more or less a chance of you know with those touch screens kind of hitting the wrong place? Uh, you can something. still mess up. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> in fact, we, uh, uh, we, we uh, Bob and Doug, or, or, or Doug's uh, crew secretary, they're asking for people to send photos in, in lieu of being there personally to say goodbye uh, and bon, you know, uh, bon voyage to Bob and Doug. They asked us to send him pictures. So my son, he drew up a, a, a sign. I, sh I should go get it. It, it, it says, uh, it says, Doug, don't push the big red button. <laughs> Unless you really have to, <laughs> <laughs> so there's still a big red button, and there's still things you could do that would, uh, if you did it at the wrong time, would be bad. But um, but it's a, it's a lot. And on the touch screen, the, the thing is that um, any critical command, if you if you dim the lights, and if you do that wrong, there's nothing stopping you. Okay, but if you put in a critical command like like pause the auto sequence, or I'm taking over manually flying the vehicle. You can't just do that just with the touchscreen. You can arm the command with the touchscreen. Then you have ah. to, that is one thing you do have to push a hardware button to, to execute the command. So it's an arm fire sequence. And if you, and, and there is a hardware button in the loop. So if the, if the touchscreens do register spurious touches or for some reason are, are failing, uh, there's protection in there from a critical command. Yeah. That's good to know. Um, Das, are you collecting some questions? I am, I am, and I was getting ready to put this sign up for you, so. <laughs> oh, you want us to keep going, we'll keep going. Yeah, absolutely. Mike, do you have more questions for Garrett? 
Uh, not related to SpaceX. <laughs> That's okay. No, it's good. No, we're good. I'm good. Fire away. Oh, well, I was just, um, I was kind of done with the m much of what I wanted to hit, but I just can't wait to ro watch a rocket launch next week. Yeah, it should be, uh, should be exciting. What time of day is the launch, Garrett? It's the afternoon. I think uh, it's like three o'clock. Is it three o'clock in the afternoon? Two thirty something. I think like it's that. four. I... <laughs> you better get that right. <laughs> <laughs> we get the AM PM right, Garrett. Uh, as, you know, as long as as long as Bob and Doug get it right, they they oh. if they open, we're in trouble. What no, time is it like in metric? 4 30, 4 25, 4 30, 4 something or other. Yeah, Eastern. I think no. Yeah, Eastern time. Yeah. yeah. That's what it is. Someone should know. Gotta get the time zone right. Yeah. Yeah. And Summer, we, we can we can start the Q and A. If you're ready to toss into the Q and A, we can definitely start the Q and A. Go for it. All right. So uh folks, as we've been sort of hanging out here, let me see if this scene works. Yes, look, we're getting more and more Brady Bunch the further we get into this broadcast. Um, as we've been sort of hanging out, uh, I, was, I was typing in chat over there that we were going to have a little bit of time to do some Q&A from people that are in the audience that are in chat right now. So if you're watching, I wanted to say this, if you're on the, the KerbalSpaceAcademy.com landing page, there's a button you're going to need to click to get to the chat. If you're already on Twitch, you're already watching, you know how to chat. Uh, if you have a question for us, start it with the word question, and we'll go through a little bit of time doing some Q&A where you can ask your questions to... Uh, Mike and Garrett over here. So I just I just pointed the wrong way, um, but uh, that is what we are going to do now. So all of a sudden, there's a there's a deluge of questions. Mike and Garrett are ready to go. Ready. All right. So let's go like this, and I'm just going to pick it straight up since we were just talking about the touch panels. So we've all used computers before, right? And we've all had our computers on the fritz and blue screening and it's frozen when I try to open my Excel document or, or whatever, right? Um, how are the touch screens on the new Dragon? Like how do they test those or how do they make sure those aren't gonna blue screen in the middle of the flight, Garrett? Well, um, let's see, so it, it is tricky and, and you do, so we, we do a lot of testing of both the hardware and the software. So. One of the big advantages is that we do a really extensive software testing to make sure that, you know, there's some subroutine in there that divides by zero and there's a bug that will freeze up the screen. Uh, and, and the hardware, you know, we test that and we, we even hit it, at, we even put it into radiation chambers and hit it with, with uh, ra the, the kind of radiation it might see up in space. Right. Uh, and we test it at different humidity levels. So, so in, in NASA was actually really concerned about uh, the reliability of the touchscreen. Uh, early on, and so we signed up to do a, a really uh, tremendous amount of testing with that. And I think, well, NASA is certainly happy they're signing off on it for flight, but uh, I think it, it'll be just fine. And you know, touchscreens are, are are becoming more and more ubiquitous and more and more reliable. I, I toured a, a modern U.S. Navy warship uh, that was just be, being commissioned, and the bridge was full of touchscreens, and right. there, was, there were very few switches on that thing too. It's just the way that uh, the way we're going. I, I have them in my. Uh, in my airplane, I had them, and, and so it's uh, it's something I think we're all just getting used to. Yeah, gotcha. And so if, if something goes on with the touchscreen, you had touched touched on this earlier. Oh, geez. Um, is there a, a physical joystick or something? If you have to go to manual control, is do you like pull it out of the wall, or how, are there no. any physical controls? No, there's no for, – for flying, uh, there's no the, – if you're flying, you're already in a contingency situation where something has gone wrong. Right. And so you're already a couple failures deep to get there. Uh, if on top of that, the touchscreen uh, stops working, first of all, there, there are three screens. So you have redundancy there, you have three processors. You, so so, you, uh, so you, you, you know, the loss of any single touchscreen won't stop you. Uh, uh, and, and so I think, but there's no like mechanical joystick that you can, it's not like uh, Wally where like the wheel, you can take the wheel down and spin <laughs> it, you know, nothing like that. Gotcha, gotcha. So, so like you said, uh, that's a really important point. By the time you get to a point where an astronaut is having to fly it manually, you're already a couple failures deep because you were talking the Dragon is so automated and, and up to date. I guess you could say, right? Yeah, the plan. You know, so so Bob and Doug are going to do a little bit of manual flying on this mission to test it out. Right. But the in, intention is that uh, that will be the only time that uh, that Dragon is flown manually on a nominal mission. It's all it's all automatic. Gotcha. They're going to do like a barrel roll or something. I don't know how you do that in a capsule, but 
No one dug. I think there might be there might be a few aerobatic maneuvers. I would think, a, a, you know, maybe a split ass a Cubanade, something like that. <laughs> something like that. <laughs> um, let's see here. Getting some more questions here. Um, what do y'all think of commercial flights of Dragon? Uh, like, like the flight with maybe an actor maybe going to the ISS. I mean, I saw in that photo we were looking of uh, the touchscreens, it looks like the two people in the center seats had access to the touchscreens, but it almost looks like there were some passenger seats in there. So what do y'all think about uh, non-astronauts flying like like tourist mode on Dragon? What do you think, what do you think Mike? You, you uh, work with actors? You look at me? <laughs> <laughs> looking the wrong way? Is that you? Um, I, uh, well, I, I think that's part of the plan. I mean, Garrett will know he, he, you know, he helped set all this up, but, um, but I think that's one of the exciting part of this. And in some ways, I think what's happening on Wednesday is really the, the realization of a dream that's been around more than just the last few years. Uh, when the shuttle program came in, I was talking to Charlie Bolden about this the last couple of days. Charlie was our administrator a few years ago and, and, uh, he uh, he was part of the, I don't know if he was in the first set of, of shuttle astronauts, but he was picked early on in the shuttle program as a pilot, and he flew as a pilot and commander for the shuttle. And he was saying that back when, before the first accident, they were looking at at the possibility of the of the shuttle becoming a, a, a true commercial vehicle. They, they were flying, it was reusable too. I mean, that, that's the other thing here is that it's, it, the shuttle was really the first attempt at a reusable spacecraft for people, and it was reusable except for the external tank that, that didn't come back. But it was a very expensive way to do it, unlike the way that uh, Garrett and his team came up with at SpaceX when he was working over there. But but I think it's it was something that we've always wanted to do and uh, to have have this vehicle that could be used for commercial purposes as well. Uh, he, Charlie told me a story that there was they, they were putting together manuals for pilots, commercial airline pilots, and possibly like United Airlines might have been interested at one point is that this is the future of flying people around it. This is going to become like a commercial vehicle. And then the first accident happened and that kind of stopped that. But we were flying, you know, members of Congress had flown, a senator and a congressperson had flown in space. And, and we were flying guests. The teacher in space program was part of that. And you know, when, when Christopher McCall, of course, was on that Challenger when they had the accident. So that kind of stopped it. They realized, well, this, we're not there yet. And... So I, I think that what we're going to see on Wednesday is not just the, the fruition of, of a dream that came about at the end of the shuttle program, but I think also one that's been around for a long time. And I think a big part of that is the commercial aspect of it, that you can have people fly in space who aren't career astronauts. Right. And Garrett and I really didn't have much of a choice uh, when we were when we were trying to become astronauts. I mean, I, we want, I wanted to be an NASA astronaut because I, I think it's the coolest job in the world, even when you're not flying in space. But for people who just want the experience of flying or have a very narrow, or I shouldn't say narrow, but have a, a specific goal like making a movie or developing this one piece of equipment or doing this experiment, they may have access now. Um, so I, I think that is that is a, a huge element of this. There's a lot going on. It's the first time we're launching in a long time from U.S. soil. It's it's this combination of a, of a new model for doing business for NASA, not just doing it on its own or with a major contract, but doing it with a private enterprise. And it's also this the commercial possibility. So. Right. Gotcha. It, it almost looks, um, from looking at that picture, it looked like there were some seats where maybe you couldn't reach any controls. So I was sort of wondering, like, all right, this is this is the pilot of the capsule. I, I guess that's just a good follow-up question. Does the capsule have, like, a, a commander and a pilot? Or is it we're just all along for the ride? Or, or how do the responsibilities for control of the capsule fall to the astronauts that are riding it? Is Bob going to be the commander? Like, how does that work out? Yeah, I, you know, I got I to gotta read up on how this all fell out because they ended up doing something that's kind of like what we did during Apollo, where you had like different commanders and pilots for different parts of the mission. Like there was a lunar module pilot, the command ah. module pilot, remember that in Apollo? Yep. So they did something similar like with that. So I think somebody is uh, the Dragon pilot and then somebody is the Dragon commander. And like when they get close to the space station, I think they switch. Gotcha. I don't think they actually get up out of their seats and swap. <laughs> I think it, 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 they change responsibility. I don't know. Yeah. It's complicated. But <laughs> yeah, as far as operating the Dragon goes, it's, it's a two... It's, it can be done by one person, but it's really designed to be optimally, uh, optimally and not normally done by a two-person crew. And it's the two seats in the middle. If you, if you can put that picture back up with the interior, I could walk you through it a little bit. Yeah, I can. Um, Let's see here. Two, the two center seats are the, and the left seat would be the commander, and the right seat when you're when you're in them would be the pilot, just kind of per the standard. 
And I think I might um, not be on this scene, but here we go. Let's say, uh, yeah, this is going to be summer back in the scene there real quick. But uh, there is the picture of the inside of the dragon. Okay, there you go. So those two seats in the middle, the one on your, as you're looking at it, the one on the right is the commander, the one on the left is the pilot. Uh, and, and they're the ones that have full access to all three of the screen. You can kind of, if you look really carefully up there, you can see the three distinct screens. Um, so yeah, the two uh, crew members that sit on the outside of, the, of those two center seats, uh, they don't have access unless they have really long arms or get out of their seatbelt, I guess. They, they, don't have, <laughs> they don't have access to those controls. Um, and, then, and then the thing is that this is for a, a, a space station mission you have these four seats, uh, and that's a standard crew for a NASA flight. And then the, below those seats, right now it's all empty, but below uh, on, a, on a mission, even on Demo 2 mission, the, the area below those seats is going to be full of cargo uh, that, that take up to the space station. Ah. Now, if you're, if you're not taking, if you don't need to take cargo with you, uh, which the space station requires, you could put actually three more seats into, the, uh, into a bottom row, in which then you have like first class and coach <laughs> coaches the three seats on the bottom, and then you get your four first class seats up top. So you could fit up to seven people uh, inside this. No kidding. It's I was I was sort of drawing on the screen how it, it looks like from the arrangement of the seats, like you'd have a trouble reaching the screens from the other seats. So that's good to know. The two interior or the two center seats are the are sort of the control seats. And I was picturing it. You said about you know if one display goes down, you could still run the spacecraft from another display. I sort of pictured them swiping their displays over like here's the commander display and here's the pilot display and they're like all right now switch and they just swipe the displays back and forth and they switch it's kind of it's kind of like that in the sense that you can bring up any display on any piece of hardware right uh so you can you can see anything you put on that left screen you can put on the middle or the right and you can generally comfortably reach two of the three gotcha so you always have at least one backup and then you can always ask the other guy to help out if you if you, if you lost two or Right. When they're when they're working on the scenes, we've seen this in Soyuz before where they have the little reach extender, right? The stick that they have to poke the screen with. Um, I assume you don't need a, a like a like a reach extender if you're sitting on the dragon because you're touching the touch screen with your hand, right? You know, I'm trying to remember there was a time there when we we're looking at like uh, a really small, like a five percentile anthropometric subject might need some assistance. It's designed to, 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 to fit a wide range of people and there's some adjustability right. in the seats, the sizes of the seats. And the, and the, but uh, I'm not sure where we ended up with that as far as a stick goes. I, I, that might've been just for me. And I think once I left the company, they said, okay, we're not gonna find anybody that's short, so we don't need this. <laughs> we don't need the sticks anymore. <laughs> might've gone away, I don't know. That, that'd be a juxtaposition of technology, like the high-tech Dragon spacecraft, and then like, oh, I got a stick to poke the controls with, right? <laughs> Yeah, it always looks a little out of place in the Soyuz. So we we had a stick like that in the shuttle too, right? Mike, remember the swizzle stick? Yeah, very very useful thing to have because uh, you had the the shuttle was was mainly switches and dials and pushing buttons and and sometimes you couldn't reach and especially under powered flight when you're being pushed into your seat, it's hard and you're being shook around. It's hard to reach things yeah. and move your arms as easily. So yeah, we had them. They were pretty. They're pretty useful. Uh, Useful tools to have. Yeah, that that actually seems like a big uh, boost of having touch screens. You said you can put any of the controls on any of the touch screens, right, Garrett? And in shuttle, or if you have physical switches, it may be that only one person or two people can reach a switch. But if you can bring up the controls on any one of the screens, is that more flexible? I guess it is. It, it allows us to, um, you know, we have there are different parts of the screens that are prioritized in different parts of flight. If you if you're uh, under G uh, during launch or during entry. Uh, then we don't generally put things at the top where you have to really reach for. We put things where it's very comfortable and you can reach under G. So, um, so it does give you the ability to tailor that for and make it phase specific. Gotcha. So you, you know, maybe during entry, the certain thing is right there, and once you're up in space, we can put it anywhere because then you can float and we can we can tailor it depending on what part of the flight you're in. Right? Oh. And then we can also we can learn if we said, oh, you know what, we really should provide this information or. Um, or this new control, we can change it, you know, just in software. You don't have to, like we decided in the space shuttle that, oh, it'd be really nice to have another cup holder over here or something, or, or maybe move the switch panel from here over to here. You're not going to be able to do that because you have to rip apart all the wiring. You have to recertify the thing. But with touchscreens, it gives you a lot more flexibility and reconfigurability. 
Gotcha. Yeah, that's something I hadn't thought of. The the different phases of flights, you may need different controls that are front and center. And when you have a multifunction display, you can move things around even for different phases of flight. So that's that's actually really cool. I know a lot of people were like, oh, touchscreens, geez, my phone, my phone's a touchscreen and I get mad at it sometimes. But uh, this is a little bit <laughs> different than your phone, right? Yeah, <laughs> a little bit better. More, a little more, more robust. All right. Uh, so let's see here. Um, we all mentioned this a little bit earlier. And, and Ricardo, I think you might have missed this part. Uh, this Ricardo from chat was asking if SpaceX had plans to name each one of the different spacecraft. So I think the answer to that was, as of now, we don't have we haven't heard of names of them. No, not as of now. But we're lobbying for Fred. We're lobbying for Fred for the. <laughs> <laughs> we're gonna do a situation where the astronauts who are riding it give it like a like their own name right and then there's the official name or something that's the danger yeah they may start when the astronauts start naming it yeah you could have trouble yeah. <laughs> that was that was an apollo thing where they were naming it uh charlie brown and snoopy or something and they had to come up with more they did charlie brown and snoopy i think it was apollo 10 yeah charlie brown was a command module snoopy was the uh and then the columbia and the eagle i think were apollo 11 and i'm yep. sure they kept going but Yep. I think that there was some sort of... A more people be watching. They better get serious. You know, they can't do the Snoopy thing. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> hey, Snoopy can get serious. away with it. Fred is a very serious name, right? If we go for Fred. <laughs> Fred and Ethel, you know. Let's go. Gotcha. So From here's... I Love Lucy, for those of you who are young. <laughs> From I Love Lucy. <laughs> yeah, there you go. So here's another question from right before a, you were born. a little bit from Jen Dandy. Uh, if you had a chance to go to Mars or beyond, would you? So Dragon is not a spacecraft designed to go to Mars, right? But we're looking at bigger spacecraft, maybe a Starship sort of thing. So for each one of y'all, um, would you be interested in going to Mars? Mike, I know you said you'd hop right on the rocket and go back to space. Sure. But what if you were going all the way to Mars? Uh, I, I think that would be a cool thing to do. Yeah. You know, I, but, you know, it, it, it takes a lot to get there. It's going to take a lot of training and a lot of time and, you know, I, and so I can answer yes because I don't think no one's ever, no one's really going to ask me other than, you know, the people on this like, call. Like theoretically. So, uh, but if I was seriously asked, I'd have to really think about it. But uh, I think an opportunity like that, you don't, you don't turn down. Gotcha, Garrett. What about you? I mean, it would be an incredible adventure, but uh, I, I also got uh, other considerations. I, um, I've got. Uh, so I'll tell you the story that one day I was out doing a, a public event. I was speaking, and I was wearing the same blue jacket. You know. And I came home and I got home in time to tuck my son in, in, into bed and he was going to sleep. And I came into, into his bedroom and he looked up half asleep and he saw me wearing this jacket. And he goes, Dad, are you just in space again? <laughs> no, I was at the I was at the audit. I was at the, you know, the auditorium there. But um, uh, I said, no, I was not in space. But I said, listen, you know, I'm, I'm not going to go back to space unless you come with me. Ah, and then yeah, he, I'm sorry. And he said, he said, uh, but dad, I don't have one of those blue jackets. <laughs> <laughs> There's the gift shop. You can go to the gift shop. Yeah, I told him we get him one. So I, got, I, I really yeah, yeah, did you get him one? Uh, what's give, that? Give him one of your extras, man. That's what I did with mine. I gave him to my kids. <laughs> yeah. Well, he's still, he's got my genetics, so he's still pretty small. He's not going to, he's not going to, he's got to grow into it. But the, <laughs> But, but the, so uh, Mars is like a, a commitment kind of thing that like, I think realistically for me to go, it would have to be a family thing where we would be going together as settlers, you know, uh, if we got to that point. Wow. So, gotcha. Yeah, that, when the kids, see, my kids are grown, so I'm ready to go again. <laughs> You're ready to go. <laughs> wait around, wait around, Garrett. Yeah, two more years oh so here's another question from a rocket enthusiast and this this is actually a really good question i hadn't thought of have bob and doug been in the specific capsule that they're going to fly in so they've gone through training there's simulators there's mock-ups and and all that sort of stuff but have they done any training in that actual capsule or do I'm they train sure. in i'm pretty sure they have uh, i don't know if it was necessarily training or just a familiarization but but I'm, I'm, I'm almost, uh, you know, as they've been preparing that capsule, uh, I'm pretty sure that they have spent some time in there. I don't know exactly how much, and I don't know exactly what the exercise was, but there, there would be too many opportunities in the clean room. It's been sitting in the clean room in Hawthorne for a long time. There would have been plenty of opportunities for them to get inside and take a look around, and um, I'm pretty sure they have indeed done that. Gotcha. How about at the pad? <laughs> how about at the pad, Garrett? They must have done some kind of TCDT or something with the vehicle, don't you think? 
What was the they question? Did one, but I think they did everything up to the point where they actually got into the vehicle. I think they just walked to the end of the uh, access arm and stopped. Now, the, I just noticed that the, it went vertical on the pad for the first time today. So, the, so oh, the, okay. the Dragon just got made it to the Falcon 9 a couple of days ago. Uh, and it just uh, uh, rolled out to the pad mm -hmm. and went vertical today. Right. So um, while yeah. there, and, and, the, and the crew just got to uh, Florida yesterday. So I, I, I have to check on this, but I think there might be a TCDT kind of opportunity for them in the next couple of days. Gotcha. Yeah, T TCDT, uh, I, I think it stood for Terminal Countdown Test. And it was a dress rehearsal that we would do with the shuttle, but they also did it, I think, with the Apollo spacecraft, because those things would be on the launch pad about a couple a couple of months ahead of time, typically, I think. Right. We used to do it like 30 days before. It was out at the pad, and we would do emergency drills and become familiar with the vehicle. So this is kind of an interesting thing that they're not doing that, uh, that type of dress rehearsal until probably much closer now to the launch. Right. That's right. I mean, the, the actual flight article doesn't uh, get made it to the and, and stacked onto the rocket until just a couple – until just a week before flight. So. Wow, that's wow. interesting. That's a, that's a new thing. Yeah, no kidding. Um, so another question here, and I'm going to bring that image up again, right? So Summer, your camera is going to come on for just a second. This right. is for, for the next virtual astronomy, we'll remember this. Um, <laughs> but here is the picture of the seats again, and somebody was pointing out that they seem to have pistons on them. So do the seats move during different phases of the launch or flight, or, or are those pistons just sort of like structural supports or something? The seats do move. Uh, they, they move once. Um, they reposition. Uh, so, and the reason for that is uh, to minimize GZ, which is basically uh, the the, um, the the G forces that are going either towards your head or towards your feet. Uh, they want to minimize that because they're worried about uh, some of the effects of, that we're seeing on astronauts, where their vision is uh, deteriorating up in space. I don't know if you had that happen to you, Mike. It happened. It happened to me. No. Uh, and and, um, and 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 one of the reasons my, my hair went white, Carrot. That's what happened <laughs> to me. My hair went white. Other than that, but my vision. <laughs> my hair went gone. <laughs> See what happens. I'm sorry, to interrupt. Go That's good for quarantine, though, Garrett. When you don't, when you have the hair like this, uh, you gotta you get into a quarantine cut situation. So I'm not Wait, taking my hat off. <laughs> Garrett, good good point. I guess there's a silver lining there, but. Um, <laughs> But anyway, they uh, so the seats do reposition right before the parachutes come out because then the G forces are in, in a different direction. For the rest of the flight, all the G forces are coming straight up from the floor, essentially. Gotcha. Uh, so either during entry or or during launch. Uh, so you're basically it feels like you're lying flat on your back uh, during those phases of flight. And you're taking a G G X through your chest. But when the parachutes come out, then you hang at a different angle, and so the seats have to reposition so that. Uh, you basically um, uh, you basically recline so that you're that you're still maintaining the G and mostly in the X axis. Right, gotcha. That's, I, I hadn't even thought about it. I, I I was thinking maybe there's a little button on the touch screen and you like your car seat moves right and you're like Zzz, and you can move your seat or adjust. But it makes sense. The physics are the biggest reason those seats are there, right? Um, to protect your body from the forces that you experience while you're flying. So that makes perfect sense that you would move the seat to absorb the forces differently or protect your body from the forces differently, right? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah. So here was one. Um, this is sort of a new thing. Uh, we know that the astronauts are going to ride out to the pad in Teslas. <laughs> they have the new Teslas with the uh, with the logos on the NASA logos on the side. Um, what do y'all think in terms of astronauts fitting inside of, of Tesla vehicles and riding out to the pad? Have y'all been in those or? Yeah. So we did we did some fit checks of that. We actually had Bob and Doug get in their suits and hop in um, a long time ago uh, right. with a, just a off the shelf Model X, just to make sure. The Model X is pretty roomy in the back seats. It's a pretty, it's kind of an SUV kind of thing. And uh, so that's the vehicle they'll be using and and uh, it, they fit in there pretty well. And and uh, um, so that's, yeah. So that's, a, that's a, other than that, getting to the pad is actually very similar to the way it's always been. Mike mentioned that they're gonna be using the same crew quarters and getting suited up in the same room where like, Neil and Buzz and Mike suited up for Apollo 11, then coming down that same elevator, walking out that same door down that ramp, that like, iconic moment of waving to the press. All that's going to be the same. But then instead of getting into the Astro van that we used, which is like this old uh, Airstream right. uh, kind of retro thing, which I, I actually love that thing, but, but that Airstream motorhome, uh, they're going to get into Tesla Model Xs and drive. So that's, that's it. 
They got to drive themselves. <laughs> no, they're going to. No, they, they, actually, we, <laughs> early on, we talked about maybe having them drive autonomously all the way to the launch pad. And it, we even still considered doing it in certain emergencies where you might not want to, if they need, if they're going to egress, you know, if they, we have different egress modes depending on how bad the day is and how quickly you got to get out of there. If you're on the pad, that, that if you need to get out in a real hurry, you light up the Super Dracos and you do a pad escape. Uh, and that's, you know, that can be done in milliseconds. Right. You go up. We got a little, yeah, you just go up. Go and away. Out, and then down into the ocean uh, under the parachutes. And, uh, and that's, that's, the, that's the quickest way out of dodge if something bad is happening on a launch pad. But if you have a little more time, but you still want to get out in a pretty good hurry, then we have the slide wire baskets. Remember those, Mike, those things, those sure. baskets that the yeah. same ones that we literally they're the same ones that we use for shuttle, but we had to lift them up higher because actually when you, the access arm for a dragon is higher than shuttle. So you had to, we had to lift them up. So it's going to be an even more impressive ride. And I, cool. I was hoping that before I left SpaceX, I was going to get a chance to try it out, but I never got to do that. <laughs> to ride the baskets? <laughs> yeah. There's only one astronaut that ever got to do the real one you, you know, or for the show. You know who that is, Mike, right? No. It's, you, it's, it's Charlie. Charlie Bolden? Yeah. Oh, cool. He twisted his ankle. He, like, broke his ankle, and then said, okay, no more. Oh, that, that's it. That. Yeah. <laughs> Too dangerous for astronauts to do. Get somebody else to do it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. Wow. So, uh, so I missed my, my I missed my first chance. And now I, I missed my second chance. But anyway, you have that now. On the other hand, if you have even more time, you can get in the elevator or go down the stairs. Right. Then, but it still might be a, it still might be bad enough that even though they have time to come down the elevator, maybe you don't want to put more people at risk, right? So we thought, oh, maybe we have the cars drive themselves up there. <laughs> and it, you know, it can, you can do that. It's a very well defined. Path. It's not, right. It's, not it's a controlled like, environment. So the, you're gonna have a guy waiting there. You're gonna keep a guy waiting with the, with the meter running. <laughs> no, <laughs> no, no the man. They come back. They can. They, 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 the, the, hanging the, out. You know. They're gonna have the model X set up. Those they, those cars are expensive, man. We're not gonna have them sit on there. You, you gotta me? get them out of there. No, man. They, you, you gotta get them out of there, right? So you you leave, and then if you have to go back, then we then we thought, oh, maybe they drive themselves back. <laughs> so we're so gonna drive them. Huh? Who's going to drive him? One of the suit techs or something's going to drive him out to the pad? Elon's driving. Elon himself. Really? <laughs> <laughs> that was a joke, right? That's a joke. Okay, okay. <laughs> I, 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 it'll be part of the ground crew, part of the strapping crew, I'm sure, that, uh, that'll do that. But, uh, but he had a guy that drove that bus, that drove that airstream. I remember interviewing him. And, uh, yeah, they, 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 would drive, they would drive you out there. So they just... You need to get someone to do that, I guess, driving the car. Was it the same guy every time? Did they have different guys? I don't know. I don't know how many guys got to do that. I, you know, it's, I can't remember. I can't remember. That'd be pretty cool. But, you know, once you get that kind of job, there's a lot of, there seem to be like a lot of job security and stuff like that. Yeah. I mean, you know, it's the same guys doing, you know, that you get, hey, I, I drive the assets out to the pad. Don't mess with me. That's my job. You know? <laughs> it's like tenure, right? He gets tenure driving the astronauts out to the pad. Once you, you get on that action, that's handed down through generations. They're not going to hire someone else. <laughs> I think you're right. Yeah. You don't need a lot of them, you know? Yep. Because you only have a few launches a year, so. It's not that bad because you get like three months off. I would think <laughs> yeah. so. Right? Like, In between know, launches? Like, no. You know, yeah. So not if SpaceX has anything to do with it, right? I mean, with the with the launch cadence they want, and we start getting uh, commercial crew, we start getting in private individuals flying. It may be like, a, oh, I guess it's Tuesday, time to drive the astronauts out to the launch pad again. Like, well, I've got a question for Garrett on that. I mean, what do you, there's only even if this thing is 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 really successful and they can launch a lot. Um, I know NASA has purchased how many seats is it? Do they have? Are they going to be paying people? This is what my question is for you, Garrett. When is it? When is it going to be just not NASA going there? And isn't there some sort of, you know, with the, just the life support on station, you can't have a, you know, you can't have too many people, social distancing aside, you can't have that many people there because you need life support for them when you get there. So right. even if the if the vehicle is able to take people up and down every week, that's not gonna that may not work. Do you have any insight on that? How that's going to work for the non NASA part of this? Yeah. So. Uh... First of all, it, it's it's the plan is for that to happen fairly quickly. Uh, SpaceX already has on the books a, a mission in 2021, so only one more year. Uh, so it'll be sometime after Crew One. So it'll be Demo Two, Crew One, and then sometime after that, they plan to do the first uh, mission with with the general public, with with uh, the paying passengers. Basically. Right. Uh, and they have, I think, if I remember right, I think that this, it was announced in the press that uh, they have one arrangement with. Um, 
uh, already in the books with Space Adventures, the same company that brokered the, the space tourists that went up on the Soyuz to the ISS. And then also, uh, I think another one with Axiom, uh, which is a, a group of former NASA guys that are trying to eventually build on to the space station by putting a commercial module on the front of the space station. Right. So uh, those missions are in the works and um, and, and, and so it, it's, it's uh, going to happen. So, and, and, and to answer your question, Mike, it'll be kind of the same way that Space Adventures did it in the past with like Dennis Tito and, and um, Greg Olson and Anusha Ansari and everybody, where, where they come down to do some very limited training in Houston with NASA for their time on the space station. And they have some kind of barter or, or exchange agreement where they, they cover the uh, resources that they use. Um, like they, they might trade for as, as they come up, they might bring cargo that the space station could use in an exchange. You know, they get the life support, the rights to the life support. Um, I think, you, you know, you might not get the good oxygen unless you pay extra. <laughs> the good oxygen. <laughs> <laughs> no shrimp cocktail. What's that? No shrimp cocktail, but okay. <laughs> No shrimp cocktail. Yeah, yeah. If, you want, if, if uh, you know, if, if you if you have too many bags, you get an extra charge for that too. And yeah, you, know, you only carry carry on one. It, 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 <laughs> they weigh your they weigh your luggage. Actually, they do weigh your luggage. You get a certain amount of personal uh, up mass, I guess, right? Yeah. Personal effects that you can carry are limited when you're going to the space station, right? That's right. Yeah, yeah. it's more volume than it is mass, though. Ah, it's with, more volume. But yeah. but Gary, let me ask you this: with uh, with those guys, like like uh, our friend Greg Olson went up he was going up as kind of taking a uh, a russian spot right when he flew he flew with soyuz and and then he would come back on a on a he he wouldn't hang on the space he, he had like two weeks right so it was like a crew exchange he'd go up with one crew and come back with another right that, that's, that's right. what he did it and i, I assume I, I don't know where he you know where his life support was or his his crew quarters but i'm thinking he counted kind of counted on the russian uh, on the russian side right right so that's right for, for these guys, do they are they going to go up and where they're going to sleep? Are we going to they going to be? Can still only have a crew of six? Or are you going to what's going to? I think they, they're, they're kind of taking a spot away from a from somebody else by doing that. No, I think I think this is going to be completely in addition to and and would not replace or be part of the normal NASA crew rotation. Okay, so I think so you know the six. plan is to have to have four NASA crew members go. Uh, up and down every six months um, on, on commercial vehicles, whether that be the Dragon or eventually the Boeing Starliner will be doing it too. Right. And that's going to continue at a steady pace, but uh, sporadically you'll see a, an additional vehicle show up with these, with uh, with private uh, individuals um, and they'll show up and they'll stay for however long. They might stay for a week, they might stay for a month, they might stay for three months. It all depends on what kind of, uh, kind of arrangements they make with, with NASA. Gotcha. But during the time that they are on the station, I expect that they will, um, you know, live on the station. Ultimately, what Axiom wants to do is eventually have their own module so that they have a home when they get there. And then they don't have to bother anybody else or take up any space. Gotcha. So, the, the, uh, Go ahead, Mike. What, what about the Russians? So is there any plan? I know, like, our partners are, like, Soichi, you mentioned, Japanese uh, uh, astronaut, was in my astronaut class. And... Uh, He's going to be going up there on the crew one, uh, the crew one mission. Then there'll also be, uh, you know, I guess our European uh, partners and Canadian and so on. But what was you know, different about the arrangement we had with uh, with the Russians is that we would fly their vehicle, and they would come and fly on the shuttle when we had the shuttle. Are they going to? What's going to happen with the Soyuz? Are we still getting seats on the Soyuz, and are they still going to fly the Soyuz, the Russians, and are, are the Russians going to? send guests up or the Russians going to come I'm asking like 10 questions at once, but you know, I think, you know what I'm getting at, right? It's kind of like, yeah. what's going to happen with, with that part of it, with the relationship with the, are they going to fly on this vehicle at all? Or so I think what's, what's over that. So, so, so the, 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 the plan is for the, there to always be a Soyuz and a, and a U.S. vehicle, whether it be Dragon or Starliner at, at any one time so that the crew complement on station is going to be seven, four on the U.S. vehicle, three on the Soyuz. So okay. the Soyuz is going to actually, the Soyuz flight rate will, will drop by half. So instead of having six people rotating on Soyuz, there'll be only three people rotating on Soyuz. Uh. And, but what I did hear the administrator say in the press conference, and, and I don't have any independent verification, but I heard him say that, uh, that, that what they would like to do is just swap seats so that you put some Russians on, on Dragon and Starliner and you still put some Americans on Soyuz. And that way um, you can guarantee that you always have Russians and Americans on the station at any one period of time. Okay. Um, and I think that that's, that's the idea that you would, it would, it would no longer be a cash transfer, which is what we've been doing to buy seats on Soyuz. 
Uh, instead, it would just be uh, like, hey, we'll take one of your guys, you take one of our guys. Right. But they're going from four flights a year down to two. Is that what you think is yeah. happening? And what are we what are we hoping to do with the Dragon eventually? How many how many rotations do we think we can do a year with the with the U.S. crew? Um, well, I think I think the plan is um, uh, two, two uh, basically uh, six month rotations. Okay, uh, so, so then you go. Norm. So right. and and, and then it'll be a, a combination of Dragons and Starliners when Starliner is ready. Uh, right. It'll be it'll be split between the two. Gotcha. And we're coming up on the end of our segment here. It's, they, they always say, they're like, oh, wow, 30 minutes. That sounds like so long for Q&A. You're never going to be able to talk for 30 minutes. And we always run out of time. Um, we're now coming up on 5 o'clock p.m. here. I have one more sort of lightning round question for you that I, that I have to ask. Worm or meatball? Ooh. <laughs> worm or meatball? Garrett, you go first. Worm or meatball? I'm kind of traditionalist when it comes to logos. I, I, I would go meatball. Meatball. All right, Mike. What about you? You're not talking as uh, for uh, for. Uh, I was going to say, <laughs> eat or to have for a logo. <laughs> not to uh, eat, to have for a logo. Both, yeah. <laughs> both for both questions, it's meatball for me. It's touched <laughs> by Italian American background. I love the I love the NASA meatball. I think the worm is okay. Yeah. Uh, maybe I just have to get used to it again. But uh, both Garrett and I, we became astronauts. The it was the worm was uh, was not very popular. Right. And it was the NASA meatball and. I kind of like it. You know, it's retro in itself. It was the original insignia. Yep, yep. Uh, for the space program. So I kind of like it. Yeah. Cool. I, I had to ask that real quick. I'm going to bring Summer Ash back over here with us. Let's see. Did I get this working correctly? Whew. It worked. All right. <laughs> I, can um, I be contrary and say that I'm Team Worm because that's what I grew up with? Nice. <laughs> Um, I'd, I'd probably go with the worm as well. So we're 50-50, um, the astronauts with the meatball and uh, the non-astronauts with the worm. But, folks, um, that is going to come up to the end of our show here today. Uh, Intrepid Museum Virtual Astronomy Live. This is the second one of these we've done. Hopefully we get even more of these going. Massive thanks to uh, Garrett Reisman. Oh, look, I'm going to Brady bunch it here. Garrett Reisman for joining us today. Um, thank you so much for the time, Garrett. We appreciate you. Uh, my pleasure. It's great to be here. All right. And Mike Massimino, as always, uh, Mike, thank you for your time today as well. And uh, thanks for hanging out with us here. We appreciate you my as well. Pleasure. Nice, nice job, you guys. Thanks, uh, Summer and, and uh, Garrett. I'm not sure which way to point. Like, <laughs> Just... No, this way. I'm sorry. I can yeah. see it now. Okay. <laughs> there, wait a minute. There, there he is. There you uh, go. Anyway, uh, I can't even figure that out. But uh, it's always fun uh, uh, talking to Garrett and... Uh, uh, my my pleasure to be here. And yeah. Thanks uh, thanks for the interest. I think this is a big day coming up on Wednesday, and I think it's really cool we had Garrett here because he played a big role in getting that vehicle going. When I was still with NASA, Garrett left in 2010, I guess, right, Garrett? Yeah. He used to yeah. come back. Um, I was still I was still in the astronaut office, and uh, he would come back and give us his briefings on what that was all about and uh, what was going on with SpaceX. So, we're, he's got. We've, world expert right there so really really lucky to have one us yeah. today absolutely absolutely and then summer ash as well summer thank you so much for being our moderator today um y'all summer ash right here give a round of applause for summer, Thanks, summer. there you go yeah all right Garrett, i have one last question is there going to be any zero g indicators no <laughs> earth. I, you got I, the I earth. Yeah, yeah i think there's gonna be a zero g indicator it's gonna be it, its name is bob <laughs> its name is bob <laughs> Bob and friend. Bob and friend. Bob yeah. and friend. <laughs> all and right, y'all. Uh, shout out to all my friends back in New Jersey, all my friends and family, everybody back home. Hi there. All right. Good deal. Well, that is going to be the end of our uh, Virtual Astronomy Live here. I'm I'm your host, John Galloway. I'm the Twitch streamer who sort of pushes things in the background. And when Zoom doesn't behave, it's me frantically sweating, trying to slap it into line over here. But we got it going today uh, for our second Virtual Astronomy Live here from Intrepid Museum. I'm going to make sure we do this. Uh, Astronomy Live is <laughs> very much appreciated. It is, uh, let's see here... Generously supported by the New York Space Grant Consortium. Consortium, I pronounced it right that way. It's not consortium. It's the New York Space Grant Consortium. Uh, so we appreciate the support there from them. And then also produced by Kerbal Space Academy. If you've watched the stream here on Twitch, you know that's my deal, trying to bring some cool STEM outreach educational stuff for you. Also, we have a couple special credits, uh, imagery and stuff like that. Today, provided by SpaceX, NASA. We got some pictures from Summer there as well. And then also one of our photographer friends, Pauline Acklin. 
Acolin right there, giving us some of the images of the space shoots and stuff like that. So for now, we will all be signing off and uh, saying goodbye, and we hope to see you hopefully next month for another Intrepid Museum Virtual Astronomy Live. Thank you very much for joining Thanks, us. Thanks, Thanks Summer, for keeping us straight. Oh. Thank you. Garrett, Thanks, Garrett. Can you hold on one second? Yeah, sure. Whoa. Okay, hold on. Sure. Re Uh-oh. <laughs> Is he getting the sign? I don't know. What's he doing? What he's getting. We don't know. It's a surprise. We, this wasn't in the rehearsal because there wasn't a rehearsal. Hey! Oh, hey! Oh! Oh! Just to say hi. hi. There you go. Hey, Buster. How's it going? Good. <laughs> All right. Are Buster, you going to Mars? Or Meatball, which is your favorite mess oh. NASA logo? Meatball. Yeah. Love <laughs> <laughs> that kid. All right, Garrett, thank you so much. And uh, everyone, thank you for watching, and we will see you next time. <laughs> <laughs>